January the 10th. I just welcome my students to our virtual class that we have for Adobe Photoshop. We're going to be starting momentarily. I will be switching the camera over to my desktop and we're going to be recording um, each and every session if possible. Sometimes I have had issues with the recording, like technical reasons, but for the most part, we will try to record everything going forward. All right, so here we go. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. I'm also going to um, allow you to have any questions. You can always raise your hand. Uh, you can always give me a little thumbs up, the emojis and stuff, just to keep you guys on point and to keep me going as well. Sometimes it's awkward to, it's like speaking to yourself for a long time. It's a, it's a little awkward at times, but I, I got used to it by now. I've been doing this for long enough. Um, my main forte, my preference is to teach you in person, which is I, which what I do for the other classes. And I'm sure I'll get to see you in the next semester where I will teach you the UX UI class as well. All right, so I'm going to share my camera now and I'm glad you guys can hear me because I already got the um, testing done earlier. So we'll go ahead and share my screen now. I think I have to also. Right, this is like the new updated software, so I have to. Uh, I'll have to. Um, I'll have to quit and reopen this apparently the way it's telling me right now. So let me, um, I'm going to be right back, everyone. I apologize for the delay. It's asking me to uh, quit and reopen because they did update the Microsoft Teams school version and I did have to update it again myself. So I'll be right back. Stay tuned, please and thank you. And just like that, I'm back. So it looks like it worked out okay. Now I'm going to hit that record button one more time, and hopefully this will be able to uh, track our progress. All right, so here we go again. Um, I think if the recording is already in progress, I don't have to do it all over again. Good. Uh, it has happened in the past where I had to uh, hit the record button twice and then I had to sometimes they have to re-record some of the other sessions. So I think we're good now. All right, so we're back again. I updated my software. We're ready to get started. I will share my screen now. I want to welcome everybody again and I will get to know you eventually. I'll do my roll call of the attendance and I'll call out your names just to make sure everybody is present. So just a quick thumbs up if you can see my screen. I want to make sure you guys can have a, a nice look at it and you can see everything. So please let me know if that's the case and I can see you guys acknowledge me. Thank you, Anna and, and the rest of you. I appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so here we are at the. Um, Blackboard, I'm looking at the Blackboard uh, course that's being delivered um, through uh, Humber. We use our Blackboard platform. All your courses are listed here, as you know already. So this is the Adobe Photoshop GDPW 112 course. OK, and the section is IRA. And uh, pretty much what I did was I transferred my course from last semester to this semester. So everything that you see here has been done already. This is not new. We, I've been teaching this class for a number of years now. I think ever since 2000 and, um, 2018 actually, okay, for Humber. And I've been teaching Photoshop for almost a decade, if not more. Um, I used to also work at the Toronto Film School and other schools, uh, institutions that train different um, creative professions. And Photoshop happens to be basically in every subject. 
uh, from business to fashion to marketing to graphic design, web design, web production. Uh, Photoshop is still a very, very important uh, class and a subject that's being taught across various uh, um, educational institutions, colleges, universities. I believe even high schools teach it now. More and more I meet students like yourselves and ask the question, how many of you use Photoshop? I think I get like more hands up now than I used to before. Uh, so I do expect some of you to already even, even know the subject. And if you do, that's great. You can just obviously learn more or even um, be a good help for your peers. I mean, I'm sure you guys will have a, a classroom where you get together and you can help each other as well. So the more we know, the better we're at. That's the way I see it. Having said that, let me do a quick question analysis here. How many of you have used Photoshop in the past before? Just curious to see the number of uh, people. Okay, so I'm asking a question and I'm just looking for how many hands go up. I see a lot, a lot of hands. Very good. I think most of you, actually, if not a good half of you, have used Photoshop before. Very good. See, actually, like I said, these numbers keep growing and growing. And like I said, Photoshop is being taught across all levels of industries. So even if you haven't been doing graphic design before, you're changing industries for something else, you've definitely used Photoshop before. So that makes it even easier for me to teach the class because most of the stuff you're probably going to be okay with. And for those of you that haven't used Photoshop, don't think of um, kind of, you know, assuming that everybody knows. I'm, I'm going to treat this class like nobody knows Photoshop anyways. That's the way I approach it from the ground up. So even if you have used it, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of new things you can pick up. Maybe you've used an older version or even a different platform like Mac versus PC and those kind of things. Uh, it'll be a definite benefit to those of you who have and obviously those who haven't because uh, this is an introductory course, especially in the very beginning. We are going to take it very lightly. And of course, later on, we get a little more, you know, intermediate and advanced because in 15 weeks, I'm going to show you a lot of cool stuff from print to web. We're going to cover lots of different topics. All right. So thanks for sharing that. I'm going to now go back to my um, screen here. As you know, I, I did provide you a class link for this um, for the course. You just click on the virtual class link. It's the same link for every week. So every week around six o'clock, you click on the link and we can meet here as we did today and we can do the class. Um, so this will work for us for the rest of the semester. The recordings will go on a, I used to post the recordings here through Humber, but then they expire and then you have to get permission. So what I did was I created a YouTube channel so you can access our YouTube channel and watch the videos there. And I do have some previous videos that I have loaded. So you, I guess you can watch those or we can upload the new ones, of course, for this class, which makes sense. Um, you might have to give me some time to do that because Editing and uploading videos is a whole new task that I, I wasn't expecting of doing, but because I'm embarked on the on the fact that I'm recording these, I'll have to consider doing just a little bit of editing, maybe not too much, but even uploading it and doing all that stuff, it's time consuming. So it might take me like maybe in the next few days after the class is done to upload the video. OK, and just uh, I'll try to do as fast as I can, basically. OK, next important thing, Adobe Cloud subscription with Humber. I'm sure this was already explained to you by other teachers uh, this week. I don't know if you did mention you have Mondays off, so you did have class yesterday. So I'm sure this was mentioned to you. And if you're in the classroom where do you guys have a do you do you did you bring your own laptops or you have computers in the classroom? I think you have bring your own laptops, right? Give me a hands up if you brought your own laptops, just so I know your situation with the software. Right, okay, so you brought your own laptops, very good. So that means you do have to get the subscription. In the past, we've had computers in the classroom and students still got the discount because look, um, being a student here, you guys get a really good deal on this uh, application bundle. Okay, you get it for only one year. And if you click on this link that I'm providing you with, if in case you haven't, you should, you know, you, you need this by the way for all your classes, because a lot of these classes are computer based. You have Illustrator, you can have InDesign, Photoshop with myself, 
um, you know, those are the main three, Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator. You're going to have the web class and the typography class. I'm sure it's going to be taught in Illustrator, InDesign as well. So you definitely need to get these apps. If you haven't, click on the link. It'll take you to the actual uh, Humber on the Hub website. This is where you purchase the bundle. For 12 months, you pay $175 Canadian and and that's a spectacular deal. It used to be a little less before, but just like anything, the cost does goes up. It's still better than paying. Uh, I forgot what it was now. Adobe Cloud. I think if you do just get the normal. So take advantage of the offer. Like don't pay the full price because this is a lot cheaper for the year than you paying. Um, what is it now? Let's see. Individual. Look, Photoshop alone is. $30 a month, okay? $25.99 plus taxes, right? The Creative Cloud, look, it's $80 a month just for you to get it as a professional, all right? And if you're a business or a student or teacher, you might get a better deal, but you still pay $26 a month for the all the apps, which is pretty not a bad deal, actually. As long as you're a student, you get a good rate. It's like a gym membership, maybe less. Um, and this is for the annual plan. So if you do the math, this will still cost you around $300 for the year. Whereas for the Humber, you save half the money and you pay 175. So it's still a better deal. So I'm not sure. I'm not trying to sell it to you guys. I'm just trying to save you money. So please make sure you do that. And that'll get you access to all the programs. Okay. And go through the whole downloading process. Alrighty. So that's, that's done already. Make sure you have done that. Let me see how many of you did do that actually, because I'm sure, um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can let me know. But I'm assuming that most of you did get the actual um, uh, software, right? So you need the software. Um, e even my other class, I teach the web development class. A lot, of, a lot of them don't need the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, but I told them, listen, it's worth the money. Even if you learn only two subjects with me, you can easily use it for other stuff like XD, um, you know, Dreamweaver, um, InDesign, other tools as well. Okay, so now we're going to go back to uh, Blackboard for a second. My bio, uh, just again, my name is Miller Adaftoski. This is not my favorite picture, by the way. I got to change it. But uh, <laughs> I spent over 20 years teaching and focusing on the latest trends of creative design. Um, basically, um, I've been teaching for 20 years and plus. Um, I work as a senior level designer uh, right now. I have my own company. It's called Creative Group, and I do still consult other companies on the side. I love teaching. I enjoy it. This is what I love to do, and this is why I'm still here. Um, so that's a little bit something about myself. And then there's the course outline here. There's a folder for that. If you open it up, you'll get like a welcome package. This is welcome to the course package. So this gives you two other files which are important. The course outline is a mandatory thing we have to give to you as students. It just gives you the expectations and all the formality of the, of the program. Nothing too important. OK, just to see like if you have any questions or concerns, you talk to your associate dean, Larissa Durovitz. OK, she's the head of the department. So you have any questions, you ask her. Amber is no longer part of the department, so please ignore that. Uh, um, Roberto's also the lesion, so he's the person you want to address some other concerns to if you have any questions or anything like that. But those are the two people. Larissa is like your best bet, okay? Alrighty. So as, you, as I said before, this is the Adobe Photoshop class. That's the course name. Your department or your program is graphic design for print and web. That means we are going to be covering a good amount of print material in the first semester and in the second semester we're going to switch it more on the website as well so here's the course description quickly uh, you're going to develop the working knowledge of adobe photoshop all of its composition tool techniques for graphic design multimedia design and print production this introductory course is the first step towards developing and understanding of the application and its position in the industry the focus will be on using Photoshop to manipulate images, uh, letter forms to create rich raster compositions, optimized for press and digital spaces. So like I said before, print and web. The course will also explore how Photoshop links to other programs in the Adobe Creative Suite, such as InDesign and Illustrator. We are going to dabble back and forth to see how important they all are, because Photoshop is not a standalone application. 
although you can do a lot of things by itself, Photoshop loves to collaborate with other programs as well. All right, so again, this foundational course introduces you to the skills required to produce and prepare raster based documents and compositions in a professional manner for high end digital and off set devices. Photoshop is an essential piece of software in digital imaging for both print and web designers. The skills you will acquire in this course will enhance your design both as students and professionals. OK, and I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to quickly go over some of the important points. OK, so uh, going to the main important stuff, your, your assessments. This is how we weigh this course. There's a slight change that we did. We're no longer doing the in-person one-on-one stuff or presentations. So I think I added more marks toward the projects. You'll get that later when you see the assessments overall. You're going to get five in-class assignments. Five because I'm going to try to give you one every other week. And if you do the math, there's a, there's a break in between in week eight. So we have seven weeks of classes. Then we have a break week, which is week eight. Then we come back for another seven classes, which is a total of 15 sessions. We call it the 717 system. So seven weeks of school, take a break, for, a break for one week, then you come back for another seven weeks. And before you know it, it's going to be April. And I can't wait because the winter is not my favorite time of year, although I do enjoy it when it's nice and calm. Um, so aside from the exercises, you will get two main projects. So the first project is, is going to be the book cover, sorry, the poster. I guess the movie poster project, you're going to do that. That's a great composition a project to keep in your portfolio. And the second big one will be the book cover. So both of these focus mostly for print and obviously for web as well. OK, the book cover is going to be mostly for for print, obviously, and then we're going to look at some other options. So print and web. In between that, you'll have composite assignments as well. Composite means you're going to work with other classes in collaboration and my class. So for example, your first composite assignment will be an ad campaign. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you this already, but you'll find out anyways, where you will create an ad campaign and you're going to utilize Illustrator to create some of the graphics uh, for the ad campaign. You're going to utilize Photoshop for the digital imaging, which is some of our stuff. And you're going to put it all together using InDesign, like a layout composition. So you can use all three programs to create this composite assignment, and there'll be two of those. There'll be one that's going to be due in the middle of the semester and one at the end of the semester. Aside from that, um, this class is pretty, uh, you know, pretty laid back, pretty easy as long as you, you know, come and show up and do all the uh, assignments that you're asked of. And usually you'll have no issues. You'll probably end up getting good grades if you're a pretty creative and a pretty astute student. So, you know, nothing to concern about. It's not a it's not a hard class. OK, it's um, you know, I would rank it in the middle. I guess it's not too easy because Photoshop does overwhelm people sometimes. I try to make it fun. I strongly believe in learning and having fun at the same time because then you have more interest in doing it. So that's definitely uh, something that I like to keep doing. And I think that's the course outline. Now I'm going to open another important document. This one's even more important, OK? This is your critical path, and all your classes should also have this. And the critical path is broken up like this. And before I continue, I, I do have to remember to stop and ask for questions because I do ha have a hand up. I think you see Vincent or someone else might have a hand up. So let me just pause for a second before I get into the critical path. And I promise you once we're done the formality, we'll get into the action and we'll have some fun today. OK, so I'm going to try to make this as intriguing as possible. Uh, let me go back to the. Um, chat here to see if. Uh, OK, so I see the Pally have her hand up. Anybody have a question? Please raise your hand so I can I can call you out and you can ask me anything that you want or maybe you're OK. Let's see here more. OK, so no questions then. Good. Good, so I guess we're OK, so I'm going to keep on going here. If you do any questions, just give me. You can even interrupt me. Like, I honestly don't mind sometimes. I know it's rude if you interrupt people, but sometimes in the nature we're doing this and you have a quick question, you can just call it out. Say, excuse me or something like that. It's fine. Uh, I've had it happen. Even raising your hand, I can. if I can see it, that's good. If I don't, you can just, just go ahead and uh, speak out. It's fine. 
And if you have to go to the restroom, you can go. You don't have to ask me, okay? <laughs> that was a little joke. But uh, yeah, please do so. That's even in the real classroom. We're adults, so that's fine. I always tell students that in, in person. And here we go. So this is the critical path. This is the most important document here. Uh, so we go by this one in terms of all the classes. This gives you a clear outline of what, uh, you know, what everything uh, is planned and and when everything is due actually. So this is your weeks. The dates, I like to leave this blank because they change from semester to semester from different days. So you can actually write the days. So today, if you want to print this and write this in yourself, would be, you know, Wednesday, January the 10th. I just put January the 10th and 17th and and 24th and so on okay uh so this is the topics and activities that we're going to be covering for today i'm not going to read all this i'm just going to acquaint you with it so you're familiar with what this is so today for example is the demo of basic skills covered in photoshop we're going to do selections today we're going to look at the interface and look at the just basic file format so we're going to get familiar with the application today just to have some fun in photoshop and maybe uh bring your skill level up to par because some of you maybe haven't used it before and it'll be a nice way to dive into it as well. You're also going to get an exercise today that I'm going to give you. This is worth 3%. It's going to be due next week because it says see exercise one due. I'm going to assign you the main project, which is the movie poster next week as well. So we're going to get the ball rolling right off the bat here, OK? But again, slowly. So today we're going to have a nice fun exercise. We're going to get acquainted with the software. And next week we'll continue doing that. And then I'll give you like a project to work on. You're also going to get the composite one also assigned by Roberto, I believe. So you're going to have that one coming up in week three. Then exercise two, I'm going to give you as well. And that one's going to be due the following week. So you always have something happening every week here. Like uh, not necessarily have to hand in something every week, although you're, you know, us doing stuff in class is going to be happening every week. Things are going to be due almost every other week in a way, the way I kind of break this down. So I don't want to overwhelm you either, but there is like nine items in total. I think there's like five small little exercises, uh, two main projects and two composite assignments. So that's like a total of nine. All right, now week eight, we get the reading week. This is where perfect time to get the book cover project assigned to you. So you get to read a book and you get to have a reading week at the same time. OK, so that one's going to be assigned to you near uh, in the halfway point of the semester, and that one's going to be due probably, you know, somewhere in the middle of the following half, which is somewhere somewhere in March. All right, so this is how it's going to go, and right to the end, uh, I don't know if we're going to have presentation for you guys for the final project. We'll probably try it out. If not, you can just deliver it to me online, okay? And that's when your last composite assignment is due, and that's week 15, somewhere in April. I think the first or second week of April. All right, so this is your critical path. It's it's good to keep track of this to see when everything is due. Another way to do it is through the actual calendar. I really like how Blackboard enhanced their interface. So if you look at calendar, you can see all your stuff. Like you click on month view. That's what I do usually. And you can see everything that's due. So all your classes that are due right now, you can see it right here. See if, or here what I see is the well for this class I see the you know color abstract exercise due next week, and the photo restoration due the two weeks after that one right. So this is how you can view the calendar. If you go like next uh, next month for example, you can see some more items. What's better is if you exit the course. Like if you come, this is my three classes that I teach for the semester. If you click on calendar just on the left hand side here from the main Blackboard interface. You can do the same thing by clicking on month. Then you can see all your classes. OK, so you can see, look, last day to add a course, right? Last day to drop out of a course. Um, you know, then you have all the assignments for all your classes listed, which is I kind of look at it from a bird's eye view. All right, so this is uh, something that I recommend you do in your case as well, because you can see everything that's kind of happening at the same time. All right. All right, so I, I just had my get to meet my students yesterday. I teach them the UI class, just like you guys. I taught them Photoshop virtually, and they, they were so happy to see me in person. And we had a nice little reunion, and they were very ecstatic about the next semester. It was a bigger section. I think I had like 35 students. Uh, you guys are a smaller cohort, which is good. Smaller groups are better sometimes. 
but nonetheless, you're not small. Over 20 is still considered a good size class. So having said that, I mean, you're going to develop a good relationship with one another and you're going to work together. And, um, you know, sometimes it might seem overwhelming, but you'll get through it. Just keep going forward. And, you know, um, our success rate here is really good. So if you have any concerns or anything like that, reach out to us. We're here to help you. But just in case you see all these assignments, don't get overwhelmed. They're all very simple, you know, easy to do assignments. You just have to invest the time. OK, so I'm giving you some strong words of encouragement there and we're always here to help you. So always reach out to us. OK, we're, we'll do our best to accommodate you as well. All right, let's go back to the course Photoshop. Here we go. We're now looking at the we finished the course outline and the formalities. Let's look at the class module. Now you are only going to see two modules. I don't want to go too far ahead and overwhelm you but I will show you the other modules as the weeks progress. So for now, you should see module one, intro to Photoshop, and this is something that we're going to start with today. I did give you a link to the to the official Photoshop tutorial website. Uh, these are really good professionally made. They're not YouTube tutorials. They're like professional Photoshop tutorials. So if you click on one of these, you want to refresh yourself. Even after I'm, I'm done teaching my class here, you can definitely uh, go through some of these basic tutorials to get familiar with the program. I mean, even we have to watch this from time to time because I mean, when I use Photoshop, it was back in the first time I used it was in the late 90s. OK, so that's how far I go back and Photoshop changed quite a bit since then. So every time they make a change, we have to stay on top of it, right? So, you know, whether it's joining different work group sessions, I used to attend seminars and all these other different events and, you know, online right now, you can always keep upgrading your skill level with the program. So this is a link that I gave you to for you to click on and access some other Photoshop tutorials online. And of course, there's so much uh, resources out there, even YouTube. I mean, I know I mentioned that earlier. I've seen some really good tutorials on YouTube as well. Uh, not all of them, but, you know, just like anything else, you have to sift it out and look for the good ones this is your first exercise so if you open this one up this will give you the actual abstract exercise that we're going to do today you don't have to open this because we're going to make one ourselves so it's just the psd file that we're going to make and quickly if you, if you dive into next week we're going to continue by actually using our lesson files which is which is the selections menu it says melon head it's like a tutorial of fruits and vegetables so we're not going to start that until next week and when we get there we'll see what that entails okay so don't worry about that by the way i have to update this so don't even just please ignore this altogether i'm just going to hide it for now because it's the wrong file because uh, i copied the course from last semester so this is the finished version i'll give you the beginner file so you can do it from scratch basically all right and same as this one here it's just a just a demo just a quick um preview of an example all right aside from the modules that you're going to be getting every week from here there's the class exercises and assignment folder so everything's organized into folders and sections so you can easily find stuff so here you have all your um assignments so the first one is your color abstract exercise that we're going to start today or this evening you can't see these, but you will eventually have you know, a photo restoration exercise, which will be due in two weeks from now. We'll do an advanced composition assignment. That's when you start getting more acquainted with the software. We're going to do a clipping max exercise and we're going to do it at the end. We'll do a motion design for web, a basic animation. So basically, I'm going to do some motion design with you in Photoshop. So we're going to create a, an animation for a website. OK, so that's something that we're going to do from print to web. These cover a, lot, a vast array of different topics. Uh, in addition to that, there's the main projects, as I mentioned earlier, the movie poster. I'm going to talk about this next week, so I don't want to overwhelm you on the first day, but this will be the first project that you're going to get, OK, like the first real project. So you're going to create a movie poster of your choice. OK, you can start thinking about it now if you like. You can pick any movie that you like, uh, a movie that you've watched or haven't seen or it doesn't have to be necessarily like a motion picture a lot of the stuff is done on netflix now and some other entertainment channels so you know you can choose from one of those and the book cover is hidden because i don't want to uh, you know overwhelm you with too many items at the same time you have your composite assignments as well this is one of the 
requirements for my class. Again, like I don't want to, I don't even want to talk about this at this point because I'd rather have the other teacher introduce this to you. He's going to be the main one that's going to be delivering the expectations. This is just the actual part that's required from my class for the main deliverable. OK, so it's just a I'm just a portion of that that's due. The main stuff is going to be done, I think, in InDesign. So wait for that Roberto to explain it to you and then I'm going to follow up with my requirements for this one. So please ignore it for now. And lastly, we have the resources folder. I'm going to keep updating this, but the way I see it right now, you have everything you need, starting with the Photoshop PDF tutorials. These are my favorite. Uh, they're a little dated, like I mean, they're older, mostly over five years, but they're still very, very good because they cover all the main aspects of the program. OK, so I would definitely I just wanted to pass them down in generations and give them to you guys as well. So you can definitely take advantage of these um, again. Nothing right now, nothing urgent. Maybe in the future I can, um, you know, kind of dive into these and show you a few things. Layers and selections is our main go to resource here. We're going to use this for the, I guess, first half of the semester. We're going to definitely use this folder here to grab our resources because we're not going to just go on Google and YouTube or, you know, grab images from the Internet. We will at times, but this is going to be our file um, delivery system. So we're going to have the layers and selections folder where you're going to grab resources and assets and we're going to work with this folder here. So just remember, because I'm going to probably ask you next week, we'll start with this next week. Today we're not going to do that, but next week we'll start with this one here. So you're going to click on layers and selections, and there's two different zipped components. We're going to start with selections first, layers second. So just that's the way it orders. Because, you know, Photoshop, in terms of knowing the program and creating your own compositions, you can't do it without knowing how to use selections and how to use layers. Those two integral components make Photoshop what it is today. Without these two things, you wouldn't be able to do much in the program. All you can do is maybe some minor color adjustments and you know color corrections and things like that. But you need these in order to take it to the next level, and this is why I'm using these uh, specific to, um, resources. Photoshop uh, tools quick tip. I think this is up to date. If not, you can get this online. It's just all the tools, all the array of tools that are visible now. But if I can go back to the earlier thing I mentioned about some of the um, earlier versions of tutorials and you know PDFs and stuff, a lot of these tools are still derived from the original tools of the program. And I don't know what background you have. I know a lot of you had your hands up when you use Photoshop. I'm sure most of my students that ask the question, they all use an older version of Photoshop because Photoshop evolved from, you know, version one to version 28, whatever version it is now. It, they stopped counting, so they're using things like years, like 2024 instead of version 26 or whatever, right? So this is why the tools are pretty much the same, if not, um, when I say same, I mean the main tools are still the foundation tools of the program. What they do over the years, and this is a you know from a business strategy, any every software company likes to add more you know tools and more features. They just add more supplementary tools. Uh, some of them are really good, I must admit, but a lot of them, if I was to teach you Photoshop like 20 years ago, I can still do the same thing I'm teaching you today. Maybe some of the things might be different, the approach. But a lot of the fundamentals stay the same, OK? Like selections, for example, like the rectangular elliptical selection, uh, the lasso selections, OK? Uh, the, the clone stamp tool, OK? We can do like image retouching and stuff, cropping images, slicing websites, the magic wand, OK? These are all like legendary tools. They just added additional tools to these to supplement some of the other methods that are, um, you know, uh, implemented. So then you have some of the more modern ones and a lot of them are miscellaneous tools. Like I'm not going to like go through each tool here and teach you Photoshop. That's not how it's done. We're going to do methods and techniques to get the jobs done and the tools will be the actual, you know, uh, the way we're going to be handling the task at hand. So the tools will be something we're going to use to get the job done. But it's more like the concept and the approach and the method. And the tools are just there to help us as tools. 
So this is how, uh, when you see all this overwhelming breakdown, is when you hold the mouse, that's when the tool expands into the sub tools. You got to click, hold, and wait, and then you'll see the sub category tools in there. And like I said, we'll cover most of these, if not all of them, but some of them are miscellaneous and redundant. Like there's no need to to do some stuff that's just because it's there. Okay. All right. But for the most part, we're going to cover all the important things you need to know. Listen, you're, you're only going to have Photoshop in one semester. This is the only class that's being taught in one term. You're not going to get Photoshop again next semester. So this is why we have to cover everything here. Uh, whereas the Illustrator class, like the digital drawing class, you're going to have the digital drawing two class next semester again. You're going to be doing some more advanced digital drawing stuff. OK, uh, same as uh, page layout one, there's page layout two. So you're going to use InDesign next semester also. Those programs are more technical and more project driven, so you're going to be using them more. Photoshop will be like a one time thing and you're going to use it with you learn it with me this semester. All right, so I think in a nutshell, I covered all the resources here and you know, as weeks go by, we're going to dive in and see other new things that I'm going to introduce. But right now, I think it gave you enough to comprehend and to work with. So we're going to now go ahead and start with the program. I'm going to take a quick break and see how everyone's doing first in terms of uh, if you have any questions and stuff. Checking my record button. Oh, I think I got the classic version here. There we go. See, Teams has a new uh, program. It's called Teams. It's, it's the new version. Uh, I think, did you have to download Teams or are you doing this with the browser? I can't remember how uh, with the platforms and stuff you have to do it. So give me a hand if you have to download Teams as the app. Just put your hand up if you have to download Teams. OK, so you have to download it. OK, that's OK. All right. Uh, let me see again now if you can kindly lower your hands again. I'm going to ask you one more question. How many of you are using a Mac? I want to know the, the platforms because I can reference PCs and Macs as I go along. OK, you know, before I ask this question, I would get probably like two, three people. Now I get like almost, uh, you know, half the audience using Macs and the rest of you have PCs. Very good. Now, here's the thing. I'm I'm staring at a Mac myself. I'm using my MacBook Pro. I've had this computer for years now. It is my go to for this stuff. I, I do prefer the Mac, but I also use a PC. So you have a PC right beside me uh, on my other side of my 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 office studio here that I have. Uh, so I do have a PC. I use both in conjunction with one another. Um, so I, I do like the PC for what the PC offers, like for internet stuff and other things I do with it. Um, and the Mac, I use it for my creative stuff as well. So I use both computers as tools. I don't have a real preference, but Mac would be the first one because I, I think the updates and the crashing seems to be a little better on the Mac side than the PC is a little more. Uh, for the stability stuff I'm not too pleased with sometimes. All the Windows 11 did make a good change. So speaking of the Mac here, we're using, uh, and thank you for contributing again, by the way, uh, for letting me know, because I know I can see now it's half and half. So I will reference shortcuts. If I say like copy control C means PC, command C means the Mac. So Mac has a command function with shortcuts, whereas the PC substitute is the control key. Now, Mac has a control key as well, but the command is the main shortcut shortcut key. There's command, option, all right? And control is like a right-click button. I remember once my mouse didn't work and my right-click did not work, so I have to use control in conjunction with my mouse to get a right-click to work. That's a good little tip for those of you that have one mouse. <laughs> did you know Did you know the uh, the Apple computers only had one mouse when they first came out? When I first got my Mac, it only came with one mouse button. They didn't have the right click. Um, Apple was very stubborn even back in those days to keep it simple. And the whole agenda of Apple's the simplicity, right? The one bite from the Apple, the the, the open, the, the clean space, the clean look, the very simple approach. Uh, over the years, most people complained and said, listen, we, we need a right click. And eventually they caved in 
and they introduced the right click button where now you can right click on the mouse. If your right click doesn't work, I think you have to activate it uh, from the control panel settings. So that's uh, something we do in the classroom as well. All right, let's get back to the application now. So now that I did all the formality introductions, what I'm going to do now is look at my, this is my desktop here, as you can see, I've got a lot of folders and stuff hanging out. If you go to about my Mac, you can see here, it's um, just so you know what operating system you're using, right? Sonoma is the latest one. It's version 14, okay? Uh, if you're using Windows, I hope it's compatible with your Adobe Cloud subscription, so make sure it's the latest one. Keep the stuff up to date, and you can see everything that's there, okay? Um, I like the new Sonoma, because if you click here, it, it gets rid of all your windows. You click again, it brings them back. It's a nice little toggle switch. It's kind of cool, right? Um, so that kind of like some of the new features and updates they have, whereas before you had to kind of switch to, you know, mission control. This is another way you can access all your applications, okay? You can press escape to do that. There's shortcuts for this. Um, we're, all my applications are down here. It's like Photoshop, I have Illustrator, InDesign, I have Adobe Animate, I have Adobe XD, which now we're switching to Figma. Because for prototyping, I think XD got discontinued, unfortunately. I used to love working with XD, but now we're kind of transitioning over to Figma, which is also a great tool. We just have to adapt to it. And then there's Adobe Rush, Premiere Rush for like video editing stuff. Then I have the 3D program called Blender, which I'm not too acquainted with, but I just have it there for opening models. And then I have some other third-party software as well. Now, if you go to your applications to open Photoshop, a lot of you, if you have a Windows computer, you have to hit the start button. And I would strongly suggest it's down here somewhere on the, on the Windows side. I strongly suggest you pin the applications to the task bar. See, the Mac calls this the dock, and the PC calls it the task bar. Okay, so it's just drag and drop. Like I can basically go, you know, open up an application from here. Let's say I want to install or just make um, my. Adobe Dimensions, great 3D program here for packaging. Let's say I want to make this a shortcut. I simply drag this down here, okay? And I just made a shortcut. So you don't have to look for programs. You can just open it this way, okay? And to get rid of it, just simply drag it up and it removes it from your dock. PC is no different. This is called the task bar. You just simply drag your application executables there and you can start the programs. So the same thing goes for, you know, and I got my Microsoft applications as well because you need those. All right, so make sure you get all your tools armed and ready to go. And now without further ado, let's start with Photoshop. So I'm going to either you do it here, Adobe Photoshop 2024. This is the latest release of the program. Or you can also open it from the start menu, wherever it's located on your computer, launch it, and there it goes. And the weather is looking not too shabby, I guess. I just came back from Florida, so this weather kind of took my nice uh, surprise to come back to the cold weather. Um, you know, it's um, it was good while it lasted. Like I said, I don't mind the winter too much. It's just the wind and the rain is not my favorite. The snow I can handle. It's not a big deal. Um, all right. And this is what Photoshop looks like when you open it. You might have some previous files that you've worked with here. You will have, uh, you know, the introduction happen here. Click on the new file. If you click on the new file, it's going to open this uh, window to prompt you on what you want to do. All right. Um, so what we want to do here, and you can watch me do this, or you can work together with me. I prefer if you can do both. If you can have a separate screen, maybe if you can get like a tablet and join me with Microsoft Teams on your phone, even on your tablet and then use your computer to follow me. Like I have like, right now I'm looking at, I don't know, like three screens. If my phone's here, I'll be four screens. I'm, I'm used to staring at three, four screens at the same time. One, I have my PC, I have a tablet, and I have my laptop, and I have my phone, and I have a TV behind me as well. So I got like five screens. I'm 
little, little bit of ADD there, working with too many things at the same time. But uh, I'm used to looking at multiple screens because it just makes me more proficient in getting things done. If I looked at one screen all the time, it's really, I'm limited that way, I feel. So if you can get like another screen, like a little tablet or something, or even uh, if you have another computer or a monitor, you can have me talk or demonstrate on one part of the screen, and yet you'll have a free screen for you to work with. So you can follow me along with some of these exercises. So that's a quick tip I want to give you. Uh, so now let's look at the new document settings here. We have something called saved and recent. A photo, as we all know, Photoshop is a digital imaging program. It is the most powerful digital imaging program on the planet. There's no other program like Photoshop. There's a lot of copycats and similar programs, but Photoshop is the mother of all. It even happens to be in the English dictionary now. People use it as a you know part of their vocabulary, like you hear in the news and stuff. Like, did you Photoshop that? Or you know, people know what everyone, the whole world knows what Photoshop is about. And then we have so you can set up a Photoshop default sizes for creative artistic use. Okay, so like this is for photographic stuff. Photographers might want to use this one for photo formats. Then you have print, the more specialized graphic designers that want to create a letter size paper. There's also legal size paper. This one's slightly longer. It's eight and a half by 14. By North American standards, we're all using eight and a half by 11. So if you go to an office like a Staples or a document center, the standard pa page, most of the pages that you see in front of you, like letters and everything, they're all eight and a half by 11 inches. OK, so you can actually create a document in Photoshop that matches the exact size of a letter page document. A legal is slightly taller. It's got like 14 inches in height as opposed to 11. Then you have the tabloid. The tabloid is like putting two of these side by side in a vertical format. So if you add eight and a half and eight and a half equals 17 by 11. So this is double than this one which presents a good one for us to do for the movie poster project, because you can print this one at your conventional printer. I remember my old printer he used to print 11 by 17. My new printer only handles eight and a half by 11. I think even 14. But if you go to Staples and if you want to print this, um, you know, at any other printer, you can pay like a dollar or two. They can give you an 11 by 17 printout for less than a dollar and you'll get a nice color printout for your portfolio. And believe it or not, I'm hearing more and more print is coming back. Uh, you know, it never went away really, but people more and more, there's a store in New York where I think they're flooded with, with customer demand for magazines and stuff now. So, you know, it's good to always kind of, you know, be diverse in print and web, not just print. I mean, or not just web, because people for a long time thought print is done and this and that. But more and more people now, they want to get more in touch with stuff. They still want to touch something, feel something, okay? The tangible engagement of a human response is, is imminent and important. So we always need to, you know, we're human beings, we need to touch stuff and feel stuff. So uh, I don't think print's going anywhere. Even if it is, it slowed down for sure. I know it affected a lot of publishing companies because they were kind of oversaturated as well, but it's not going to go away. Okay. So this is, again, if you want to print stuff, this is a good way for you to do your portfolio. A4, this is the European standard, okay, A6 and A4, but we're going to stick with the North American standards up here. All right, then you have art and illustration, another very free form type of design. We can, uh, maybe we'll do one of these today. We'll just do like have some fun and create an abstract design with a 2000, maybe we'll do a 1000 by 1000 pixel grid. And 1000 pixels is basically 1000 pixels width and height. Then you have the web stuff. When we get into week number uh, nine, week eight or nine, we're going to start creating stuff for web. I'm going to have you uh, maybe for you to create like a website prototype in Photoshop. So you are going to create a website in Photoshop as far as, um, you know, like a design for you to integrate into HTML. So we are going to use some of the web formats here. You can make a common size, large, medium, minimum, there's different sizes. And websites now, it's not just about websites anymore. Um, you know, 90% of us use our phones as opposed to using our computer to check stuff really quickly. So the mobile is here to stay. So the new format, you can design uh, mobile prototypes, not necessarily apps, because that's a development thing. Uh, you as a designer might design the actual prototype 
for the app, which we're going to do next semester in the UX UI class. And here you have the most popular phone formats you can choose from, like the iPhone X and the older generations of iPhone. And then you have the, you know, the um, the Android as well. What happened to Android? There we go. There's the Androids, right? Microsoft Surfaces and all the other iWatch. Look, you have the. So you can basically look. You can make icons. So you can, all these different digital things you can create from the presets given to you by the program. And yes, Photoshop's also big in the film and video industry. A lot of times. Um, you know, movie makers will come to Photoshop and create a title. Or they're going to create some kind of graphic or some kind of a, you know, illustration or design that can partake in their film or commercial, especially with YouTube now, right? It doesn't have to be that big in depth, but you could go up to 4K. It's got 4K capability. So you could create a 4K design splash screen for an advert or some kind of a movie or documentary or whatever is film and video related. So Photoshop is basically catering to every industry out there from film and video to web to print to mobile, you know, photography, art and illustrations, everything that you see here. That's why we call it the mother of all, right? So we're going to go ahead now and open. Um, let's start with Let's start with art and illustration. We'll keep it nice and um, you know creative today. We're gonna do some nice fun stuff. We're gonna go ahead and open a 1000 by 1000 pixel document from here. Once we select the preset, Photoshop's gonna ask us some more details on the right. These are your secondary set of options. So here you can give a give your file a name. So this will be called ab abstract uh, design intro because we are going to be designing something from scratch and we're going to make it abstract why not have some fun with it i did recently visit a very beautiful museum and i'm uh, oh, sorry i should say like an art art museum or art gallery in saint petersburg florida i saw uh, salvador dali's museum i was there i was quite intrigued with all his work and i saw some really cool surreal art and some abstract work that he did so i got some nice inspiration um, in the in the past few weeks from him. So it's a good way to revisit this. We're not going to make anything like that, obviously, but we're going to come up with our own stuff. See, Photoshop doesn't always have to rely on images and sources to get things done. We can make stuff from scratch, basically. Some people like to use like stylus and tablets and stuff to do their own um, type of paintings or artistry and stuff. We're going to use more like the tools and the selections that are in front of us because I'm not going to ask you to buy a stylus and get to the next level of drawing stuff. Maybe you're not an illustrator. By nature, I can draw. I haven't done it in a while, though, but that's how I started with this industry by just drawing and not really painting. I'm more like an illustrator. So this is how we can start with. So I'm going to call it abstract design intro. I'm going to confirm the, the pixels here, 1000, 1000. Resolution, I'll keep it at 300. This is an important part. Photoshop is the only program that's going to ask you what resolution do you want your document to be from the get go. OK, Illustrator is not going to ask you that. InDesign won't ask you that. A lot of programs won't ask you this. It's only a matter of what you produce afterwards. OK, um, there's the setting actually in Illustrator that does kind of go through this preset, but it's really muted. You won't see it unless you look for it. The color mode is um, important as well. RGB color means we're designing something for the monitor. That's why it's RGB, it means red, green, and blue. Everything that we do with our monitor, screen, television, uh, you know, phones, tablets is an RGB color. So the, um, the combination of red, green, and blue with different values, they, go for, they range from zero to 255. You can get millions of colors. That's why I have like retina displays and all these other high definition things. Grayscale is strictly grayscale. You don't want to go here unless you really have a good reason to. Same as bitmap. Bitmap is only black and white. So that was like an old thing we did with some of the, you know, purposeful methods of doing things. Um, grayscale might work in some situations, but for now, most common ones is this one, RGB color and CMYK. OK, so those are the two. Uh, the second project, for example, I'm going to you're going to be required to save your poster or your work in our CMYK color, because if you print something professionally from the printer, 
they're going to get an error and you're going to get a, a, you know, your file won't be as you expected it to be unless it's properly formatted in CMYK. And the difference is this one is RGB, red, green, and blue. And this is CMYK, which matches the, the ink cartridges in your printer. Uh, and even my home printer here, I have an inkjet. It's a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. That's what the K stands for. So C for cyan. M for magenta, Y for yellow, K for black. Why not blue? Uh, B for black? Because they use B here already for blue. So K is for black. You have also lab color for specialty use, which again, there's no real need unless you have to by some type of um, you know specific task to go there. But over the years I've worked with Photoshop, I never had to use lab color just for like some other advanced use. But these are the main two, RGB color, CMYK. So we're going to stick with RGB color mode. It's very important you set the mode. You can also set your background content. Like I want to have a white background or a black background. Maybe I can choose a different color. I can make it transparent or I can customize it. So by default, I'll leave it white. It's like a white canvas. OK, and then we can start painting on it. And that's how you can set up your documents from the beginning when you start the application. Um, now, you don't always have to even address this. If you notice, I didn't really change anything. I just explained it to you. By the default, sometimes it's good to go, but it's always a good practice to double check, OK? Um, so you can just scroll down. These are like templates and stuff. To get these, you have to subscribe to the cloud, uh, you know, library or something like that. So don't Adobe stock. So don't worry about this, OK? Just ignore it for now. So I'm going to hit the Create button on the bottom right corner. We're going to create the actual art and illustration 1000 by 1000 pixel width and height artboard. So here we go. And this is what you're going to get. Now, if your screen looks different than my screen, that's because perhaps Um, you have uh, your preferences saved as default, okay? Default means if you go to, so I'm in Adobe Photoshop 2024 here. This is the latest version. Oh, it's 25. I was a little ahead of the time here. I was I was talking about, I thought I was 26, but it's 25.3.1. Um, by the way, every artwork that you see when you open the program, if you go to behance.net, which is a creative community, I guess Zhao and on, 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 on Onikyo designed this uh, cover here. So it's really cool how Photoshop artists always um, contribute to these things. So one day it might be you. They might pick your creative. And this is a good one because this is very similar to some of the projects that you're going to be doing in Photoshop. Like to make this, you really need Photoshop's skills to make this happen. OK, and a lot of layers of use of layers and compositions and assets to make this. And you're going to do a lot of this stuff with me. So you're going to have lots of beautiful artwork that's going to look similar to this. OK, so you can definitely uh, participate in one of these, um, you know, uh, competitions or whatever they call them in Behance. Eventually you have a portfolio and you might get noticed like this, right? That's where it all starts. OK, back to Photoshop. If I go to Window, by default, my workspace is set to default, OK? But I, what I want you to do, though, is go to um, maybe go to Essentials default just to keep it normal and keep it congruent with what I have. This way we're all on the same page. So I'm going to click on Essentials default, and you should get something like this. All right, the Layers palette should come up with a nice lengthy view. I mean, if you have the properties taking over, it's fine. But just so you know, we need a lot of space for the layers below. The layers are integral of us learning this properly. So what I'm going to ask you to do is simply double click on these tabs, like whichever tab you have, just double click. This will collapse the, the side tab to smaller amounts for real estate. Same as this one, just double click. So you have a lot of layer space used here because we need to see the layers clearly. So that's one thing I'll point out as a tip before you start. So again, I went to window and the workspace. I changed this to essentials default. OK, another thing I wanted to do is go to the left here. And I know by default, your tools probably look like this. They're in a single column basis. And there's nothing wrong with this. If you want to maximize your work area, 
but honestly prefer to have the two columns. It's so much easier to visualize and explain uh, the methods and tools, especially when you get to the bottom here. It's hard to differentiate like the foreground color versus the background color and all these other things that are, it's, it's just hard to see this, right? And traditionally Photoshop never ever had a tool like this. So Photoshop always had the two columns traditionally. So I like to be back uh, traditional uh, sense of teaching and learning. So if I click on this little little buttons here in the left corner, it looks like two little arrows that will basically bring the tool uh, back to the two column layout, which I prefer and also has a benefit of you can see this nice and clear. You can you can switch this foreground and background color. You can get into quick mask mode, all these things. I strongly suggest not to start clicking and experimenting too much unless you know what you're doing. The reason is you might click something by accident, then I can't really help you get out of it. I've had students in the past, they clicked on something and they're like, what do I do? How do I get out? Like they'll, they'll press something like that and they're like, oh, what happens now? I pressed F, by the way, for full screen. So these are shortcuts that you have to be careful how you handle the program, just like anything else. Just be cautionary and try to kind of, uh, you know, be consciously aware of every step that you make. All right. So there's your two column tools. This is a tab. This is the layers. OK, um, this is how Photoshop is set up at default. Uh, if I showed you Photoshop 10 years ago, maybe more, this wasn't always like this. This tab here was a floating window. You see that I just dragged it out. This was a floating window. This is even in the, the early years of Photoshop. It was all windows, floating windows and stuff. More and more now application developers um, create the, what's called a docking system. So most of these windows and palettes are docked like this. If I drag it here, you see how it changes to blue and it dims out. That means I'm docking it back in position. The reason is if you resize it, it all kind of goes together. So it's fluid and it's responsive with different mediums like tablets and phones and things. Not really phones, but other monitors and other types of resolutions. OK, so once you get the interface set up like this, the two columns, the most important is this one. So unless you have the two columns, it's very hard for me to tell you, hey, it's this tool over here. No, it's that one. So in case uh, you want to you know, be a little more astute with me explaining things, just kind of have it at two columns. I'll say like, hey, the one here on the fourth on the fourth row, the second one on the right. It's easier for me to tell you how to select a certain tool that way, as opposed to me just assuming you know what I'm talking about. All right, so now that we have this workspace, how do we save it? Because if you don't, if you open Photoshop again, it might not remember the workspace. So one day, one way is to go to Window, Workspace, and it used to be called Save Workspace, but now there's no more Save. It's called New. New equates to Save, because when you hit New, it's going to save this as a new workspace. So basically, you're saving the workspace. So I know it's a little play with words here, but if you click on new workspace, it'll save this existing one to a new one. So this will be called, I'll call it January, January 10th workspace. I almost put 2023. Wow, it's 2024 guys. All right, 24, 2024, January the 10th. And I'm going to hit the, you can activate the keyboard shortcuts, the mage and the toolbars, but this should be sufficient enough for me to save this. So the next time I go to Photoshop and let's say for some reason my workspace changes to, I don't know, maybe motion design. I'm doing animations and stuff, right? Because Photoshop caters to every different um, you know, industry for the right tools and setup. So if I go to the workspace again, I change it to, let's say, photography, right? But if I want to go back to my workspace that I just saved, I called it January 10th workspace. I saved so many by me explaining this so many times. Uh, so again, I'm going to go to the January the 10th workspace 2024. It's going to put everything the way I saved it. So it's very, very um, important to note that, you know, I'm a strong believer in comfort. If you're comfortable with the environment, you're going to be a lot more engaged and you're going to make less errors, less mistakes and be more productive. So I suggest you do this for all your programs, Illustrator, InDesign, they all have the same kind of setup, workspace and save your workspace. 
because you know you're not going to be the worst thing you want to do is when you're starting is is doing look like just having stuff everywhere like you have your tools and palettes and and you're looking for stuff and sometimes it's frustrating you have you know things everywhere and and, and you close something by accident and you know it's it becomes a mess and hard to kind of you know control your 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 um, your workflow like this so if this happens by accident or you're just looking for something just remember you can always go back and just go back to reset your workspace right reset january 10th works because i already did a number on it and it goes back to the way it was right so it's a cool little tip to keep things on top okay all right so i'm going to start with this document again this is the one i made a thousand just in case you're watching me again i went here i went to art and illustration thousand by one thousand I, I didn't change nothing. I just explained what all this is. I made sure it was RGB color with a white background. I hit the create button and this is how I got here in case you missed that part. And now what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the basic fundamentals of the program and this will pave the way for the next lesson for the next week where we're going to use more images and selections and things like that. All right. Any questions before I continue? I'm going to check back on you right now. Just quickly. Um, Right there. Anna, do you have a question or that was just your hand up there? Go ahead. No, no, it was my hand up. <laughs> I don't know how to lower it home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think let, let me see there. There's a there's a there's a thing called raise. See, I just did it on the top. There's a menu. You can also put it down. There we go. That's a button there. All right, there we go. You figured it out now. Thank Perfect. you. You're welcome. All right, so um, let me just ask you another question since I'm here. Um, how many of you are doing this with me right now? Like how many of you, uh, it's okay if you want to watch and watch, do it later, but how many of you are following me with this tutorial? Like you can actually do it with me together. Very good, okay. So I want to encourage that. So if you can follow me along, I'll try to like, I'll keep a good pace. Sometimes I do get carried away. I go a little fast. Just, you know, you can always ask me to repeat it again or slow down, that's fine but I'm going to go at a proper pace to get everything um, done properly and to have you follow me along. Thank you for letting me know. I appreciate it. So here we go. We have a document here. Um, so basically, by default, Photoshop has a black foreground color and a white background color. That means, you know, you can always change that, of course, but that's the default. And so what that means is you can click on, let's say, the black foreground color and make it like purple or pink or whatever, right? And then I can click on the white background color and change that to like uh, maybe like a green or something like that, right? So I have like the purple and the green colors and I can always switch them like this. See the little switch button, you can switch it back and forth. That's why I love the two column layout because you can easily control this much easier. And it's very important that you keep track of this information. Well, what color do you have? Because ultimately that color will result in you applying it on your canvas. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm getting to these colors and stuff is because color is the funda fundamental, or the foundation of, you know, using anything in design with Photoshop and everything else. But if you want to reset it back to default, you simply press the letter D on your keyboard. When I say D, I mean, you just press Mac or PC, doesn't matter. Just press the letter D and look what happens. It went back to black and white. So D is always default. Same as Illustrator. Same as InDesign. If you press D, it'll reset it to the black and white. In, in Illustrator, you'll get you'll get a, a black stroke and a white fill. In InDesign, you'll get the same thing. Okay, I think you'll get like a black border with a white fill. But um, in Photoshop, you'll get the black foreground color and the white background color just by pressing D. So you can always control the default settings because black is 100% black. Look at this. There's the value for black. The RGB is zero red, zero green, zero blue. If you go to white, the value is 255, 255, 255. So it changes. Every color has a value. This is how we mix colors. So if you go to this green color here, look at the value. The red is at 138, green is at 176, and the blue is at 100. Just like a color palette, you mix colors in combination to make any color appear. All right, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. So now that we have our colors kind of established and we can set defaults, let's go ahead and uh, set some colors on this artboard. So the quickest way to fill this color here 
you can use a, a, a tool method, which is quite popular. It's under the, if you press G for gradient, if you hold the mouse here, there's the gradient tool and there's the paint bucket tool. Now, initially the paint bucket tool used to be the primary one. Right now you literally have to click on the gradient tool, go to the second one underneath it to select the paint bucket. Because the paint bucket will basically go ahead and fill your canvas any color that you wish. In this case, it'll be the black. If I switch it to the white, it'll be the white. So it always acknowledges whatever the foreground color is as the leader of selection of color, right? So if you click on the black and you change it to, let's say, like a green or any, any other color, right? And you click OK. So don't forget, when you click on a color, there's the hue on the right, the slider, vertical slider. You pick the color, you know, um, range that you like. And then the actual picker is the color within. So there's here and there. And once you click OK, then you can simply go ahead and click on the canvas to fill that color. Now, another way to fill it is this way. I'm just going to quickly pick a different color here. So I picked the green. So instead of me doing it this way, I'm going to go to Edit, Fill. This is another way you fill colors and fills in the program. So I'm going to go to, and there's a shortcut as well. I'll show you the shortcut way after. But right now I'm going to go Edit, Fill. And here you have a, a foreground color, a background color, which it equates to the foreground color is the green. The background color would be the white, or if it's black, it'll be black and white, basically. So if you do either one of those, you can simply click OK, and it'll fill it that color. So whether you prefer to use the paint bucket method, which I think it's quite easy, or use the fill method from here, is how you fill colors in Photoshop. Just like that, you can get some great color results um, into uh, the artboard. All right, so going forward now, maybe I'll keep it to black just to keep it default. I'll press D and I'm going to press black. So my background color will be black, OK? And now what I'm going to do is utilize selections in conjunction with colors to create a beautiful masterpiece of some kind, OK? So here we go. And I always wing this, by the way, so it's always fun to do this for the first time because I never, ever get the same result. And you will never get the same thing as me or vice versa with one another. So if I go to the, this is the other, this is the move tool right here. This is like your main tool. So eventually we're going to start moving things around uh, the, the document in Photoshop, like images, uh, other artwork, could be text boxes or anything. This is like your move tool. So you're going to move things around, right? There's nothing to move now because you have just cancel this, by the way, because I don't want to unlock this. We're going to keep, we're gonna, not going to use any layers today. We're just going to keep a flat canvas, just like Picasso. We're going to make our own artwork, okay? So what we're going to do with this this way is we're not going to use the move tool. We're just going to switch over to the rectangular marquee tool. Now, this is the most, uh, you know, fundamental, uh, um, you know, original tool that Photoshop had since the existence of the program. So if I go to the rectangular marquee tool, the way it works is, and this is very important right now, even if you use or you haven't used Photoshop, this is something to really, really pay attention to. So if you make a selection here, this is Photoshop's way of acknowledging whatever is selected is whatever Photoshop is right now focusing on. Okay, so it doesn't, it's like deaf ears. It doesn't care about anything else but that selection. All right, so it's very important because selection is what drives Photoshop, okay? It's the primary focus of the program is selections. And of course, layers. So what layer are you selecting? Where the selection is? To deselect the selection, simply just have to click away from it and the selection disappears. Once there's no selection, you can easily go ahead and work with this like a normal artboard. But once you have a selection present, Photoshop only focuses on that selection. So selections are an integral part of the program. With no selections, I don't think there'll be Photoshop, to be honest with you. So if you go inside the selection, you can move it around like this, right? Just simply drag in and move the, because I might want to position the selection here, over there, or over here, right? To deselect the selection, you simply click away. So I want you to practice this because mentally you're going to develop a cognitive recognition of a pattern that you're going to, you know, basically acquaint to. And this is how you learn the program, just by knowing how to do this 
than this because it's different. Illustrator is an object oriented program, which means you use that, you know, the arrow tool to select the object, right? Or the, the anchor points. Here you have a, it's all pixels. You don't select pixels, you select them by a range of pixels. And we'll get into that later with the dots and all that stuff, the resolution. But this is how Photoshop selects a range of pixels that you want to change, or you know, maybe you want to select something in particular. So select and deselect is very important to start with. And if you're in the in the space of the selection, you can move the selection. As long as you're inside, you're okay. But once you click outside, it disappears. So please remember that and practice it. Just a good way to get it in your head. Okay. It's like any exercise the brain is being exercised right now and this is all muscle memory right now for you to remember this okay so now that we know that let's go ahead and do it this way instead we're going to make a selection like 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 maybe a smaller one now i'm going to ask you to hold shift a shift is universal with mac or pc so as long as you hold shift and you can go inside the selection that you already have and you can expand the selection so as long as you hold shift you can create multiple selections that kind of coexist together and expand in such a um, you know abstract method that it kind of looks like this right so you have this interesting looking design here okay right. and i'm just clipping the edges holding shift i'm able to create multiple selected pieces here right with shift. Now, option on the other hand does the opposite. Look how a minus sign showed up. So shift, you notice a plus sign indicator resulted when you hold shift. When you hold option, a minus indicator. Option, if you have a PC, for half of you from what I remember, you hold alt. Alt and option are the same thing, Mac or PC. So if you hold alt, you get the minus key, you can subtract from the selection. So you see, you can, you can subtract areas. Let's say I don't want this. I can just go and subtract it. Well, sorry, I, I, it's the other way around actually because I had it in there. It's, I'm going to hold shift to take that away. So option subtracts, shift adds. By knowing this, this is really powerful from the very beginning to know how to control Photoshop selection capabilities to add or to subtract. It's very important. It's like math. If you don't know one plus one or you know two minus one, you're not going to know multiplication or all the other complicated formulas. So you have to learn the basics first, add and subtract. Everything else comes after that, okay? Now, in, in addition to this, I'm going to point to the elliptical marquee tool. The elliptical marquee tool is like another fundamental selection tool in Photoshop. It's round, right? It's a round elliptical tool. So basically what you need to do with this tool is you got to hold the shift key and you can add more elliptical selections like this one, you see? So notice how it added itself to the existing design. Same thing with this here, same thing with this over here. So if you hold the shift again here, shift again over here, shift again over here, I'm just adding multiple shift options to add more to this stuff. It's looking a little bit more like an abstract design. If you hold option in the meantime, while you do this, you can do a very unique thing by taking this chunk out from the whole piece like that. Maybe I'll take this out. Right? And maybe I'll take this out. Keep in mind the selection is still active, which means if I go inside, I can still move it around and I have a very interesting design that I think I don't think I've ever done this before exactly like this. And I'm sure your design is nowhere near my design and vice versa. So it's a good way to, you know, keep this original like a fingerprint. And uh, I remember my previous students, they used to do like the, uh, the um, EFTs and stuff like that, which was fun because this stuff, uh, even on the, you know, crypto market with the 
NFTs and stuff. They used to sell these things online and some of this stuff sold for millions of dollars. I don't know how, but the value of them was quite high based on, you know, the reputation the artist has and what they did. So the joke was, let's make an NFT and sell it and make some money online. So who knows, right? If that's a lot of them lost value right now, it's not as hot as it used to be the market before, but this is some of the stuff, the same methods they use to make these creative designs, uh, whether it's image based or, you know, um, color based selection based you can use photoshop to make almost anything so with me using basic tools which is elliptical rectangular and in conjunction i showed you how to use option and shift to add or subtract selections i have a selection made on top of my design here which what i'm going to do now is go to edit fill and i'm going to pick a different color not a foreground nor a background, but the actual color color, like another color that I want to choose, which will bring me back to the color picker. I'm going to pick this. I ah, might as well go with this nice bright pink. I kind of like that. It'll really brighten things up. Sure. There we go. Nice and bright. I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to keep the blend mode to normal at 100%. So when I click OK now, that's exactly what's going to happen. I can then deselect because it's already giving me the nice design that I was looking for. Okay. And now what I can do is also, um, you know, take it to the next level. So I have my two colors. I got my black background. I got my very bright pink, which brings a beautiful contrasting opposite on the front. OK, and this is a good way for me to now come up with some other ways that can utilize this. OK, so so far I did nothing too spectacular, just very simple methods of selections and fills and in um, addition to that, we used combination of adding and subtracting and controlling selections. We, 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 oh, by the way, let's have a selection. To deselect the selection, there's a menu here called select, deselect. This is how important selections are. If you hit deselect, it'll deselect the selection. Whether it's before I, I refer to you clicking away, but you have to be in a selection tool to do that, just in case you forget. Just remember, Having a selection is just as important as not having a selection. So you have to make the very strong decision from the get go to have a selection or not to have a selection. You have to be aware of that. OK. You also have something called select all, which selects the whole thing, right? If you want to select everything, you select everything and delete it or fill it or whatever you want to do with it. But I don't recommend that right now. We just want to leave it alone and just deselect the selection. Yes, go ahead. Let's say that I do you have it filled or no? Is it, is it, did you fill the selection or are you still in selection mode? Yeah, it's, it's I filled it. So if you filled it, um, you can do several things. What you can do is you can use the elliptical tool, for example, and you can, let's say I want to get rid of the circle here. I can make a circle like this and fill it black. It'll get rid of it. So now you got to think kind of like in, in contrast to what you already did. So if I have black as a foreground color and I have this selected, let me do one. Let's, let's do this one. Let's say I want to get rid of that. I just go edit, fill. Now I'm going to get into shortcuts, okay? Because I don't want to do edit, fill, you know, foreground color, which is the black. Click OK, right? The quickest way to do this is if you do option, delete, okay? Now, let me, I, I like that question that was just asked because now I can elaborate more on some of the strategic stuff. So we have black on the foreground color. I'm going to switch it to the white and the white's going to be, watch this, I'm going to click on the white color, but instead of me picking a color, I'm going to sample the same pink color that I have on my artboard. So now my colors are pink and black and I can have those colors primarily selected at will, but I have pink or black, doesn't matter. So now I can add or subtract more. Let's say I want to get more creative with this, right? So now I can go, okay, let's make an elliptical selection here. 
like this, right? Watch what I'll do now. Option or Alt Delete on the PC users out there, okay? I can add more colors. Let's say I wanna add another one over here, right? Option Delete, right? Uh, let, let's say I wanna subtract a color, okay? Let's say I wanna subtract something over here. I can go, I can subtract this. I'm gonna do Command Delete or Control Delete on the PC. So you can still do it after the fact, or you can do it before the fact, okay? That's how you can control this stuff. Now, another thing I wanna mention is, how do you go back? Let's say you're like, oh, I wanna go back three steps. You could go undo, Photoshop has multiple undos. I don't know how many, it used to be a limit, but now that I don't think there's even a limit, as long as you go back to the document open. But what's better than that is history. So if you go to the history, which is right here on the window. This is the whole history of me doing this this evening with you together. This is the latest step that we did. If you go all the way up, look, I can go to the very beginning of the steps that I made. So I can go here and go to the selection tool and start from that point onwards. I can even do a snapshot or a picture or create a new document from that. There's a lot of elaborate things I can do with this, call it the time capsule in Photoshop, which is called history panel. So this is the, the present and this is the past. Okay, so it's a good way for you to do that, okay? All right, so uh, now that we know how to go back in time, only in the program, by the way, not in real time. I wish I can have a history panel to go back in real time, that would be nice. Maybe a DeLorean, like the Back to the Future would be nice too. But we're gonna go back to the history panel to go back if we need to. Other than that, we can continue from this point forward. Any other questions before I continue? Because although it looks simple, I know for some of you it's new and uh, it's important that you understand all the stuff that I'm showing you, especially when you're adding colors, fills, selections, and controlling these things. All right, so let me just quickly have a quick look here again. No questions. All right, very good. Next, we're going to now take this and break it up into different uh, sectors. So I'm gonna ask you to select the rectangular tool one more time, okay? We're gonna go and start from the outside. Oh, by the way, another important thing, Command or Control Plus, Mac or PC, Command or Control Plus, 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 or Command, Control, Minus, Minus, Minus. This is universal all Adobe programs, okay? Command, Control Plus, Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop. If you hold the space bar, it gives you the hand tool. You can pan between the, this way you can like really, really zoom in, you see, to the pixels of what this is. That's great, I wish Photoshop didn't crash on me here. Let me do a quick save. I want to save the file because I think I because I'm sharing my screen on Teams and I have um, a lot of memory I'm using up at the same time with Photoshop. So I'm going to save this on to my computer locally and on the cloud. So I'm going to go to the desktop here and save this as a Photoshop file. And that's how you save a Photoshop file. I'm just going to close it and reopen it because it, it it prevented me from zooming in, zooming out. So let me open it again, and I'm back in business. Okay. So zooming in, zooming out. I mean, you, your your screen should not freeze like mine, but mine did because I was I went like really close and it, it glitched basically on me. But this is how you can utilize Photoshop's um, zoom capabilities. Now, if you zoom in really closely, yeah, you're going to get pixels. Okay, because Photoshop is a digital imaging program. So it derives from pixels and stuff, like photographs and images. Everything is pixel driven. Now, it does have vector capabilities. And if you go to Illustrator, you'll see nothing but clean cut lines because Illustrator is a digital drawing program. Okay, so it's different. It's vector, whereas Photoshop is more pixels. So those are the main two differences between Photoshop and Illustrator. That's why even back in the earlier days, we called Photoshop a paint program. 
and we call the Illustrator a drawing program because you paint in Photoshop, you draw an Illustrator. That's it. That was the main distinction between the two. All right, so now that we have everything set up here, let's the next step. I'm going to zoom out because I want to see the bounding box of my document. I want to see the outside edges. Because of that, I want to go to the rectangular marquee tool, go from the outside here and make a selection about maybe the inside. Maybe I'll go like halfway. Like that. I'm going to select half of my top part of my documents. And what I'm going to do with this half is I'm going to perhaps maybe invert the colors. The shortcut is Command I or Control I on the PC. On the menu, it's here, Image, Adjustments, and then we'll do like what's called the Invert. Invert will give me the opposite of what it is. Okay, so it looks like that. I mean, when you use a black, the opposite is white. The opposite of purple is green. It's like the color wheel stuff, so that's what happens here. That's fine. I'll go with that. Now, on the other hand, I'm going to select half of it this way, vertically. I'll do a vertical split like that. And I'm going to do the same thing. Image, adjustments, perhaps I'll do another invert. All right, so now I have like the opposite kind of colors coming out one from each end now if i'm not liking the you know the white or the black or the green i can always resort to the paint bucket there's the paint bucket here remember the paint bucket you can always pick the colors from your swatches or you can pick colors from here right and pick any color and basically substitute this these backgrounds just be careful because if you click on the same one, if you do this, it'll kind of ruin it. So I'm going to press Control Z or Command Z back and forth. Uh, perhaps I'll pick a different color now. Maybe I'll do some of the blues. All right, so I'll have a different color scheme happening here. All right. You can also do, if I select half of my work like this, you see I selected half, you can do the top half, uh, the middle half, whatever half you see, top or bottom, left or right, doesn't matter. Another way to change or alter color besides you filling it in by basic methods and tools, you can go to image adjustments and you can do the hue and saturation. This is like your go-to favorite tool for most um, you know, designers to come here and just change. What do you want to change your hair color, your eye color, or the color of the selection that I have here? And all I have to do is basically change the hue slider to a different value to get a whole new different color option happening, right? So instead of you just kind of being more definitive on your color change, you can have a little more, you know, um, I guess a variety, if you want to call it, by you doing it this way. You can see one more. You can change it this way like that. Okay, so we have a little more like the pastel color look. So that gave me more like a four color combination now with the different squares. Okay, so it's got a little more abstract look to it. And again, if, if one, we're going to upload this and I'll see your design. In a, when we're done this, we'll see what everyone did. It's amazing how, you know, we all have a creative one of a kind design masterpiece like this one, right? Now we're not done just yet because after now that we, and this, the whole point of the exercise is to get you a good introduction of the program, to show you some of the tools, the environment, the interface, just to get you acquainted before we dive into the more advanced stuff in the weeks to follow. All right, and if this was in the classroom, I mean, time does go a little different from, uh, from different um, teaching aspects. Me talking nonstop and you not interrupting me, I will finish the class a lot faster than me being in the classroom and then see your facial expression or your hand go up. I walk over to you or the section and I help you guys back and forth. Time does kind of expand more. So I do um, just want to point out that the classes that I teach online are not going to be as long as they're, they, they're you know, set up on the schedule, they'll probably be under two hours.
but that means you have the extra time to do work or to do some other stuff and whatever. So whereas in the classroom, time drags longer, obviously, because you were in person and we do a lot more, um, you know, interaction with one another. All right. So basically, um, we're almost done with this exercise, but I have one more thing to throw at it, and that is some, you know, a good teacher always wows their students with filters. So filters is another popular aspect of Photoshop where you can do so many cool things from the filter gallery or the filter design. But, you know, just to not um, to kind of um, take away from what we're doing here, we're going to be very strategic about how to apply the filter. We're going to do more like a distortion or as opposed to a traditional, um, you know, artistic filter or something like that, right? So what I want you to do next is basically switch to the elliptical marquee tool. And we're going to select, and if you notice a lot of these tools, if you hold the mouse hovering, it'll give you a little tutorial on how to use the tool. Like the elliptical marquee tool makes oval and circular selections. And if you hit learn more, it's going to basically give you activities and stuff and show you how to use the tool. I mean, it's pretty amazing how these programs came to be. You know what we had back in my days when I learned Photoshop? Nothing but like a big, thick textbook with a CD in the back. And the CD would have all these filters and plugins that we used to install so we can do some cool stuff that you can do right now all built in. So it evolved quite a bit with the way it's, it's also bogging up the memory because all this stuff takes up memory, like when you roll over it and stuff. So it's part of your memory resources in the program. It's all good. So if you select the elliptical marquee tool and you go over here, when I say here, I mean near the top left corner, uh, make it a habit when you do make selections, what, whatever type of selections you're making, you start from the top left corner and you go to the bottom right corner Notice how it's like an egg shaped selection. I'm holding the mouse, but if you hold shift, you have a constrained um, approach, which means you can select a perfect circle or a perfect square or any geometrical shape for that matter. So I'm gonna hold shift, make a selection, and I'll have a perfect circle encompassing my target here, which is this area. So I do it a perfect, if you make a mistake, draw another circle, whatever you want to do, right? So make a perfect circle. Uh, on that note, I also want to mention using a mouse. I don't know how many of you are using a trackpad and not using a mouse because it makes a difference. Uh, I much prefer to use a mouse when I'm designing with these advanced programs as opposed to using my trackpad. My trackpad is like if I have nothing else left, I'll, of course, you got to use something. But I definitely carry a mouse with me wherever I go because you'll be you're a lot more productive when you have a mouse and and the other hand is free to hold shortcuts like like option shift drag you know like it's very hard to do these kind of operatory things with with a trackpad right it's a little more tedious and your fingers bend all kinds of ways with a mouse it's a lot easier so if you don't have one now I, that's another investment I strongly suggest you make get yourself a nice mouse. I prefer mine to be wired because I don't like the lagging on the wireless. I do have wireless Mighty Mouse that costs a lot more money than this one. I still prefer the wired one because it's a lot more connected with my computer. And I have a classic mouse that just fits nicely in my palm. And that's what I use when I make these, you know, lessons and tutorials. Um, let me just have a quick survey on you guys. How many of you using a mouse? Let me just see quickly. I'm just curious. Let me see all the people that are using a mouse. Alrighty. Okay, good. I see a good number of you. Good, smart. Okay. And the rest of you that are not using a mouse, I just strongly suggest it. Look, you can do without it. I had students that, you know, told me for listen. I they told me that I I can do without a mouse. I don't need a mouse. And and they did. They don't, they did good with it. It just I think it's a lot easier if you do have one. To each their own. I'm not gonna you know impose on you what to do and stuff. But I think a mouse traditionally, these programs are built easier if you can multitask with both hands. You want to have both hands, all hands on deck. One hand is on your keyboard, one hand is on the mouse, and you get a lot of things done that way. Very good. Okay, so now that we have this selection made. We're going to go under filter. 
we're going to do what's called a distort filter. All right, and we're going to do what's called a twirl. I mean, these are all distort filters like displace, pinch, polar coordinates. They all do some really cool artistic things. But this one will actually twirl our beautiful color combination design into like a twirl vortex type of fashion. So you can go clockwise or you can go counterclockwise, whichever way you prefer. I'm going to go clockwise and I'm going to max it out to maybe like 827. Okay, that's just a number I've made up. I kind of like the way this twirls in the middle and you can kind of zoom out to see exactly what the result will B. So I'm going to have a nice combination of all these colors twirling together like no other. And I'm going to click OK. I hear someone with a question, so I'm going to quickly switch back. Click OK. And go ahead. The deep Pally, is that you? Yeah. Do you mind going back and showing me where to access the tour menu again? Absolutely, Deep Pally. So what I did was I went to um, filter, distort. See, distort is a very powerful. See, a lot of people don't kind of, you know, pay attention to these other ones, but distort is like the real, real game changer in Photoshop because you can do a lot of interesting things here. And I did what's called twirl. So filter, distort, twirl. All right, that's how I did it. You can use the other ones, but this one works nicely with this type of design because it nicely. You're very welcome. And this one nicely blended all the colors together in a very artistic fashion that, you know, really creates a nice blend of everything that we've done and creates a nice little abstract design. Furthermore, uh, if I just may go back command Z, I want it. I wanted to bring back my spherical selection. OK. Because I also wanted to do one more filter in addition to the existing twirl filter. And if you can just make another selection, that's fine. That it pretty much surrounds this whole area. I'm going to go to filter. We're going to do what's called distort. But this time I'll do spherize. Spherize is like a spherical type of three dimensional filter effect, which will bring all this up. Let me just see if it'll work or not. See those concave. Or convex. So maybe I'll do like the. This one here I'll do in the positive scale. All right, if it's going to help a little bit, maybe not too much. Maybe I'll do like a 34. All right, so it'll bring it up a little more. So that's another thing I thought we can add. In addition to this, and if you're not happy with this, this let's say the colors are not working out, you can always go to the image adjustments and do where its hue and saturation is. You can always change the hue to a different color value. So it's very nice how you can change this at any given time. So you can actually even change it to something like this, right? Let me click OK before and after sure i'll go with this one i like how this color uh, change happened and maybe this is a better version of it you can also save multiple versions and this will be a nice little piece that you can create your own very own abstract masterpiece right um and if you want to change some of the colors you still can if you want with the paint bucket Although I don't suggest it at this point, you want to leave it alone. But let's just say you want to change this orange dot to like a blue or something. You can always just click on it and it'll change accordingly. You can even use the, the eyedropper. You see this eyedropper tool? You can pick different colors like orange, this blue, this red. Maybe this red might look better if I change it to the paint bucket. First, I'll eyedrop this red here. See? And with the paint bucket, I'll just fill this in. Right. I have the blue look nicer, I think. Right. If you want to change these other background colors, you can. Well, that one didn't come out too well. Right. I kind of did this one to match the rest of the colors. So the red flowed right through. 
And you can make some additional changes using very basic paint methods by using, uh, you know, color um, eyedropper tool. You can select colors, paint bucket fills the colors. I think we're ready to go. This might make it in the art museum. What do you guys think? Maybe you can all have a nice um, gallery of art. And this is all done from scratch. We didn't have to rely on any AI generated images or internet or image searches. This was all done by using basic methods in Photoshop, selections, adding, subtracting, adding color, um, you know, using a little bit of filters, uh, using a specific document size. Now we're going to look at how we can save this and and share it with the rest of the world because see Photoshop is a very, very unique format that only us designers can open it and work with it. Most people don't have Photoshop on their computers. No one's going to spend the amount of money a month to have a license for this special software. So how do you show this to other people like social media and things like that? Well, that means you have to transfer the format into a more adaptable format, like a JPEG or a PNG will do the trick. If that's the case, we're going to have to do it right from Photoshop and save it as the other uh, formats. So first and foremost, let's save this as a Photoshop PSD document. As you, as you know, I already did that just as a precautionary method earlier because I did sense the computer acting a little abnormal. So I'm going to go to File, Save As. And I'm going to select my destination. If you have this, by the way, and if, if you have a Mac, you want to expand this menu. This doesn't give you much options of where you're saving it to. You can still select here, but I much prefer if you click this little button. Same as PCs, I think you might get a similar constraint. So if you click on this little button here, it'll open this bigger menu. And then from the left, Mac and PC have the same path of uh, your directory save. You can always select like the desktop or maybe your documents folder and save your stuff in there. Okay. So once you select the desktop, okay, name in case you forgot to name it, try not to ever have your stuff called untitled and always put your name on projects. When you hand in stuff, please put your name. So I would pull this, you know, I would, I would pull like Milo abstract design. By the way, Milo is like my short form of my name by Milo Rad. Uh, some people call me Milo, just easier to pronounce. If you want to do the same, that's fine. I don't mind. So I'll call it Milo Abstract Design Intro.psd. So always put my name on the file. And if you're doing like a web prefix, you got to put like underscores and other special characters. I don't think it matters with Photoshop files. If you're doing like a website, you might want to consider you using special um, nomenclatures for that kind of stuff okay so i'm going to call this milo abstract design intro psd i'm going to save this on the desktop as a photoshop format photoshop is the native format for the application of course so first and foremost always do that this will retain all the layers and all the other information you might have in the future right now it's just an image that we created from scratch so there's not much layers i purposely kept it simple and I kept it under one background, OK? Now, if we want to share this with the rest of the world, what we want to do is save it as a, as, a, as a known format. And some of the most popular formats out there that we know on the internet, social media, and things like that, a lot of photographs. If this was a photo, like a, I took it with my phone or something, I would save it as a JPEG, because JPEG captures a lot of pixels in a compressed format, which is quite vivid and very good quality, right? Even for print, I've printed JPEGs before that came out pretty nice. But if this is like an artwork like this, but doesn't have a lot of photographic stuff, a lot of colors and no gradients, it's got limited colors. I mean, if you see here, if you just try to count the colors, I don't see more than, you know, six, five or six different colors, right? Maybe four to five colors, that's about it. So if you have like limited colors like this, if it's a logo or something more like very limited with with color, but a lot of strong emphasis on design, I would say it as a PNG. I like a PNG. It stands for portable network graphic format. Uh, JPEG stands for, by the way, joint photographic export group. They're the people that created the format. So there's a quite the distinction between the two. So I would save this one uh, as a PNG. So to do that, you want to go save a copy. 
So now you're going to do this with me because at the end of this um, lesson or the exercise, we're going to have a design discussion. I want you to post yours up there and we're all, I'm going to see what you did just to kind of keep everybody right on, on point. So I'm going to save a, and don't worry if you didn't do it for next time, you can do something. But if you did it, I would love to see what you did with me this evening. So I'm going to go save a copy. I'm going to go again to the desktop and this time I'm going to select the format I mentioned earlier, PNG, okay? So there's the JPEG if you want to save it for, you know, other things. Like both of these work well, JPEG or PNG. I just much more prefer PNG because of the nature of the way this looks. So PNG format, okay? I'm going to save this onto my desktop and hit save. And now it's ready to go. It's going to give me like compression options, like the file size. I go with the large size. Okay, there's also medium and small size. This is a good one. Sometimes it gives you other options like 8-bit or 16-bit or 24-bit. Uh, I'll go with a higher bit depth just because you keep it, you know, high, high quality and stuff. So in this case, large file size, click OK, and you should be good to go. Good to go in terms of I'm going to minimize the application, and you should see my, there's my, right. This is my original one. I'm going to delete this one. That's the one I started with. It's my Photoshop file, and this is my PNG. I don't know why it's not previewing, but it should preview like this. I'm just hitting the space bar. Quick little tip for you Mac users. If you just hit the space bar, it gives you a preview of what the file looks like. I think it does it on Photoshop or PNG files. The difference is this is a PNG. This is what you can email or put on social media. Every, the whole world gets to see the PNG, but not everyone gets to see the PSD. So this is for you to keep and work with as, a, as an artist. And this is for you to give to your clients or to share with the rest of the world. The, whether it's a PNG or a JPEG, so you can post it on whatever social platform you want. Uh, there's also a file difference distinction as well. This Photoshop file, I believe, should be more. It's 311 kilobytes on disk. Size is important because sometimes if the files get too large, you can't email them or there's limit of if you posting it and stuff. Whereas if you, um, you know, keep the maintain the file size low, you can do more things with it, of course, as well. I believe the email limitations are 25 megabytes. So if this was like 27 megabytes or 30, I don't think I can even email it. So because it's only 300 K, that's less than a megabyte because I'm a megabyte is composed of a thousand kilobytes. Well, 1024 to be exact is one megabyte. So it's all by the power of threes. If you look at a thousand kilobytes is one megabyte. Okay. And a thousand megabytes is one gigabyte. And a thousand gigabytes is one terabyte, so on and so forth. All right. I'm not going to get into math with you, but it's important because we're going to work with files and sizes, you should know how these numbers work. You should know that if you have a USB stick that has like 16 gigabyte capacity, how much information you can store on it. Or if you have an external hard drive, you want to know how many, how many terabytes it has so you can save all your work. So it's important that you work with file sizes and understand how to control your file sizes as you create these files. Um, okay, so let's see how big this PNG is. Just as I suspected, it's only 172 kilobytes. So it's almost half than the Photoshop one. The Photoshop one is 300. This is 169. So it's just almost more than half. And that's quite important because Photoshop file, although they look the same, uh, you know, you can open them and continue working with one and the other. This retains more information in terms of history and probably presence and quality, whereas this one just has a PNG compressed version. It also gives you the time of the modification and other things you can comment and make stuff in here as well. All right, so now that we were able to produce um, an actual artwork and made a Photoshop file and created a PNG file, I'm gonna create a new folder. You should always do this for every class. This will be called class one. I should also make a Photoshop folder because you have other classes and keep your folders for every class and keep track of everything. So I'm going to keep both of these files in this folder and this folder will be put away 
uh, in my you know Humber folder and I keep track of all my classes. So before I start each class, I can refresh myself where we left off. So I can open this up and say, okay, we did the abstract design. Perfect, okay. Now, lastly, I'm gonna ask you to upload this on our discussion. We're gonna do this from time to time. So today I wanna acquaint you with how we're gonna interact because it is online. I don't get to see your faces. You just talk on the screen here and deliver this class. What we can do is um, we have what's called, um, I guess I can add it in here. Right, I'm gonna go up here. Let me just ask how many did this first so I can know if I'm doing this because I'm not going to do a design discussion if I have like two people following me. So how many people actually partaked into this exercise with me this evening? Let me just see hands up, please. Let me quickly go to my teams. All right, I have Gurmeet, Ash, Shaknoza, Anna, Victor, Fur, Himak Himakshi, Alejandro, Vincent, Amir, Serbi, Abinav, Atele, I got Minwu, and I have the rest of you almost. Okay, so almost everyone, right? And Okanuda as well. Perfect. So don't don't feel bad if you haven't. It's, sometimes maybe you don't have a mouse or whatever the reason is. Maybe maybe you haven't got the subscription yet. Uh, just upload it after. I want to see everyone's uh, you know progress. We're not here to you know kind of see who did what just to kind of this is all a creative fun assignment so it's very interesting how uh, one might come up with a creative design like this so the next thing i'm going to ask you to do is uh partake in a community that i created here so we're going to go ahead and uh, go to um, my module one intro to photoshop class i'm going to create a discussion group right now so i'm going to go create it'll be called a discussion and this is basically us collaborating on things like whether it's a design challenge or anything like that, that we're going to definitely utilize this tool that we have to help us. So this will be called abstract exercise challenge. All right. And what, what I want to talk about is basically the same thing. OK, so uh, beginner. All right, beginner Photoshop exercise for abstract design. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And basically, I'm going to type a response right now and you're to follow. So you can see this. Once I'm done, you should be able to see it and everyone's work can be uploaded. So when I type a response, what I'm going to do is click on this um, image. If I click on the image, I'm able to upload the file that I saved earlier. Now, just do the PNG because otherwise I have to open the Photoshop file to preview it. I've seen a preview sometimes, but I'm I'm after. I want to see that you properly did the PNG uh, aside from the Photoshop file. So look for that one, okay? So look for the the PNG file. There's class one. Here's my PNG file. Look, it won't even let me do the Photoshop. Just the PNG file. I'm gonna open that up. I'm gonna hit the next button. It's a nice little zoom thing. We go next button again. I'm going to do view and download or just view only. That's fine. Save. And there it is. I was able to upload my my um, my file and I hit the respond button. That means I'm responding to this challenge by me adding this stuff. So you can do the same thing. What I just did simply click click on the little image icon as I described earlier, look for your PNG file, and please go ahead and add your stuff here so I can see all of you contributing. And it's nice to, um, I get to see your artwork before I get to see you in person, see? So I encourage everyone to do this. I'm gonna hit the refresh button and go ahead. I'll give you some, a few minutes to do this. And why you do that? Oh, sorry, you can't see it. Let me make it visible. I do apologize, okay? So now you can see it because it was hidden before. Now you can go ahead and re refresh the page. If you refresh the page, you should be able to uh, see the, the file. So now you can go to modules, module one, intro to Photoshop. 
Uh, so we have the tutorial link, the exercise that I just did today, and you have the abstract challenge. If you click on that, it should take you right to the thing here, and I should see more of you show up eventually. So I'll, like I said, I'll give you a few minutes, and uh, I'd like to all of you to participate in this if you can. That'll be great. Alrighty, and aside from that, uh, let's see if there's anything else that I missed for today, but I believe we covered everything that we're supposed to. It's okay if we finish a little earlier. Naturally, we do, even in the real classroom. I mean, you can only talk for so long, right? That's why we have built-in lab time into the classes. We have time for you guys to do your work, ask questions, work with one another. There's even some group assignments we have as well you can do. Um, you know, just utilize the class time wisely and do your thing. Uh, you're all adults. I'm not going to babysit you, but I do trust that you're going to, you know, whatever you do with your time, it's going to be uh, obviously contributed to the school. This is why you signed up for, and I'm sure you'll have a, a good access to all your resources as well, especially in the classrooms. Um, now that you have your own laptops and computers, you don't have to rely on, you know, the school providing you with these things. Back in the earlier days, not every student had a computer and that used the school computers and there was quite the challenge you know sometimes the labs were full people had to wait for other people to finish so they can grab the computer and yeah it was tough to just have a computer to work on that was the thing so now everyone has laptops and computers and you can kind of do this everywhere even at a coffee shop uh, wherever you want it's portable and you can carry a laptop around all right, let's see how everyone's doing here with this abstract challenge. Oh, there we go. See, they're coming here. All right, perfect. We got Victor, very nice, Victor. Very nice, beautiful. Abhinav, very nice, very nice. Look at this. Himakshi, very good, very good. Very interesting there with the middle, what you did there, quite interesting. Okay, and we have Shaknoza, very nice, very bright, nice colors. Similar to kind of the colors that I had too. Very good. Anna Maria. Very good. I love the color options for that one as well. Nice, interesting choice of, of action happening there in the middle with the twirls and stuff. Very good. And we have Leonardo. There we go. I think Da Vinci will be jealous of you, Leonardo. Very nicely done there. I love how that twirl captures everything. Very good. And with Ashom as well, that's different, eh? I like the I like the different twist. I think it was beyond the twirl. I think you did a little more there with selections and other methods to get this done. I love the abstract overall. Very good, nicely done. All right, and we have Fernanda. Very good, Fernanda. Very nice. I like how you expanded on the edges there with more of the colors and less of the twirl in the middle. Very good. And who's this guy here? Oh, it's Milo, that's myself. <laughs> all right, that looks okay too. So I think we all did a great job, okay? Very nice. I'll give you all a round of applause, very good. And this is how we do like a design challenge and the discussion and and we can all contribute and, and put stuff up there. So it's really nice how, and I got more, I know I got more coming here now. So don't worry if you, listen, you still have, like I'll come back and check it again, maybe um, tomorrow or something, maybe tonight later on. If you, there's some other ones in there that I can see. Okay. All right. So don't worry if I mentioned, if I didn't mention your name, you can always uh, come back later and throw some stuff up there. All righty. So hope you had fun with this one. Uh, let me just go back and check up on you now before I wrap it up. I'm also going to stop the recording. I think we're done for the majority of the, of the lesson. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as well. And then we're going to slowly wrap it up. If you have any questions and stuff, usually it's the first day, so a lot of things, uh, you know, happen with with different uh, situations. Let me um, stop the recording first. So those of you watching, um, I want to welcome you again to the course. I hope you had fun on the first lesson. This is how we're going to do every lesson coming up. Uh, we're going to do um, an exercise. We're going to take some questions and answers and do a lot of different elaborate skills that contribute to the learning modules. All right. So having said that, I want to wish you all a good night and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now and I'll see you later. Thank you, teacher. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.